Last week, we began a series, if this is your first week back or you're visiting with us, or um, we began a series last week going through the book of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. We're titling this series, Hope and Holiness in a Hostile World. Hope and Holiness in a Hostile World. We saw that Paul, just a little bit of review, last week we saw that Paul um, was writing this letter to a bunch of of young Christians that uh, were in a church that he began after only being with them for three to four weeks. He is in a city called Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a very influential city in Macedonia. And Thessalonica was financially strong because of, of of the lucrative pagan practices that brought in a lot of money into the coffers, if you will, of that city, right? And so they're engaging in all different kinds of idolatry and pagan worship, and and it was producing a lot of income for the city, so much though, so that Thessalonica was amongst the strongest financial cities in Macedonia. But now Paul and Silas and Timothy, they kind of come in, they're, they're preaching the gospel and, and people are coming to faith in Christ. And what ends up happening is people are now turning from their idolatry, they're turning from their pra- pagan practices, and they're turning to the one true God. The problem was now they're no longer engaging in what really was fueling the economy of that area, right? And so now they're stopping getting, they're stopped getting engaged in all of the, of, of the pagan tree and all of the idolatry of that day, and they're embracing Christ. And as a result of that, it's hitting them right in the pocketbook of that area. And so they, 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 the, 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 Um, local authorities are getting frustrated because they're seeing how their bottom line is being impacted by the gospel coming to town. Isn't that beautiful? I just love to see how God can change a community when a person gets a hold of Jesus. Well, what ends up happening is they embrace Christ and now people who are at one time accepted in their community find themselves as a result of pursuing Jesus in the midst of a very hostile community a very hostile world. Have you ever felt that way? When your love for Jesus and your desire to please God forces you to walk against the flow of culture, right? I mean, that, that, that's the reality of what happens. It's not like you're against people, you're against sin, right? You're against going in the flow of culture and your, your pursuit of Jesus causes you to say no to things. And people who once loved you and respected you now see you as an outcast, now see you as a, as a troublemaker. How many, have been, how many have been accused of, well, you know, you're judging me, right? You're not judging them. You're, not say, you're just saying, listen, you know, I've been running with you, doing this stuff for a really long time, and that's just not scratching the itch for me. I met Jesus, and you know what? That's just not doing it for me, so I need to pursue Jesus. And your lack of engaging of it, and it raises the awareness that that's sin, and it judges them. Now, logically, we get that, but you know what? That hurts us right in the comfort zone sometimes, doesn't it? Because some of those people are close. Some of those people we've walked with for a long time. And it's, it's hard sometimes. Um, not hard in the sense that we're looking to say, should we do it or not? But sometimes relationships get lost as we pursue Jesus. Jesus said, listen, this shouldn't surprise you. Jesus said in John chapter 15, he said this, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before It hated you. Hey, if you were of the world, Jesus said, the world would love you as its own. And you know what? When I was living for the world, they loved me. I brought fun, I brought party, and I brought whatever, right? They loved me. I was a part of them. They felt very comfortable as we were on this pathway to hell, right? Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But... Because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you, right? The world would love you as its own, but they don't love you because you're not their own. You're mine. And if they hated me, 
they're going to hate you also. That's not something we celebrate. That's not something we enjoy, right? I mean, that, the reality is nobody wants to be hated. Nobody wants to be considered an outcast. But sometimes our pursuit of Jesus, no matter how hard we try to make sure that, because sometimes we can, we can be so offensive with truth that what drives them away is not the gospel, but our, our way of putting it in motion. We need to be careful not, not to do that. But sometimes just our pursuit of Jesus causes distancing. And notice the cause of what Jesus says the world's hatred towards you is. He says the, the cause of it is your identity with Christ, right? You're no longer of the world, you're of Christ. And you're not going in the flow of the world. Jesus said, I've chosen you out of the world, right? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We, we've been chosen out of the world. Therefore, Jesus said the world hates you. And as the church in Thessalonica walked in holiness, as they pursued Jesus, as they applied truth to their lives, as they walked in holiness, it brought on hostility from the world. And, but Paul points out to them their hope. There's hope in the midst of this, right? Yes. And we saw that hope is tied to the three tenses of our salvation. That's what we looked at last week. We look back at our sanctification where we draw confidence and assurance in Christ's ability to save. I mean, there's nothing more assuring and joyful and comforting than knowing that no matter what happens on this earth, no matter how difficult it may get at times, no matter how alone I may feel, there's coming a day where I'll be in the presence of the Lord. What greater joy could we possibly have than the fact that we have been justified by his blood? We're in right standing with God. And what Paul is calling them to is, listen, don't forget what you've come out of. Don't forget how you've put in motion the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And while you're holding on to that, we saw we are to do this while we are working out our own salvation, right? Where we're living lives of repentance and obedience. We are saying no to the flesh. We're crucifying the flesh as we're pursuing Christ. And so we're holding, we're looking back at what Christ did, has done. We're embracing what he is doing in our lives. And all the while we're doing that while keeping a, an eye on our final hope where Christ will come for his church in the rapture, which is what we're going to cover in a couple weeks as we get further into chapter four, as well as when Christ will return with his church as he will highlight for us in 2 Thessalonians. And so we have this posture of the believer that we are embracing and appreciating and living in what Christ has done. We are living in what Christ is doing and we are looking to that day where Christ will bring us home. Whether it's a hole in the sky or a hole in the ground, we're going to be with the Lord forever. Holding these truths in proper attention is critical to our spiritual maturity and effectiveness as believers. So we saw last week that, that after three to four weeks in Thessalonica, the officials drive Paul out of the city, thinking that by driving Paul out of the city, the work of God was going to stop. What they didn't realize is they can drive Paul out of the city, but they can't drive the Holy Spirit out of the city of Thessalonica because as believers were there and they embraced the gospel and the Spirit of God was in them, they didn't need Paul for the message of the gospel to go forth, right? And and so the city is continuing to grow in their faith. And so what they try to do, by first they figure, let's, let's get Paul out of the city. Well, that's not working, so here's what we're going to do. The enemies of the gospel then began bad-mouthing Paul, calling him a, a charlatan, right? Figured, hey, let's discredit the messenger with the hopes that the message gets destroyed. And so what the authorities in the area had done is they started to feed and fuel the church in Thessalonica with lies about Paul, calling him a charlatan. They questioned his motives and accused him of being there for, for personal gain. And so in chapter 2, we see that Paul addresses the accusations that are made against him by reminding them of how he, in fact, conducted himself in their midst and how he fostered a genuine relationship between him and the church. Paul finds himself having to do this a lot as he's, as he's in, his, in his ministry because 
Paul had quite a past, right? And so often, it's not like Paul's tooting his own horn and saying, look how godly I am. But unfortunately, Paul was having to put on display what God, the work of God in his life. And that's kind of like what we see taking place here. And today, we're going to see Paul's relationship with the church. In chapter 2, Paul will highlight his relationship with the church of Thessalonica. And I'm going to tell you, it's beautiful. It's so encouraging to see the heart of this shepherd, the heart of this, of this pastor, Paul. And, and, and some might say, well, he's kind of building himself up. No, he's just speaking truth under the inspiration of the Spirit, right? But we see the heart of this, of this shepherd, and then we'll see how his focus and his godly care for the church in Thessalonica Create an environment where, where, where the church will, uh, will flourish and grow and blossom and mature under his care. And so he's going to highlight some key characteristics that were present in his own life, as well as what ought to be present in the life of all pastors and leaders in the church of Jesus. And he's going to say some challenging things. Now, let me just say from the outset that I don't want to give the impression that I have arrived in these areas that I'm going to address. Uh, some of this might be a little bit awkward for me because it could sound like I'm, I'm trying to toot my own horn and that, dear God, is not the case. In fact, much of what I will point out is because I either see it as a lack in my own life. How many know we become very aware of the things that we lack in our own lives? Or it's a temptation that oftentimes comes with the office of being a pastor. And so Paul gives us some instructions, some, some critique, if you will, of some, what, what are some of the characteristics of a godly leader. I look at those, some, some of those things, I think, all right, some of those I do okay, some of those things <laughs> work in progress, just like you, right? So we're kind of like a whole bunch of imperfect people walking towards and focusing on the one who is perfect, seeking to be like Jesus. And so I, I wrestled through this, just to be completely transparent with you. I really wrestled with this because I thought, I don't want to make it look like this is, I'm, I'm promoting myself. Anyone who knows me knows I don't measure up to these things anyway. So I figured, let's keep the bar low, and then everybody will be satisfied. I'll hit it out of the park every time. Um, let's take a look at the text. You'll understand where I'm going. First Thessalonians, if you're not there already, chapter 2, we're going to pick up at verse 1. Paul says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, I love this, not, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. And so Paul is going to begin to, to, to highlight and address some of the things that, that he is accused of. And his opening here, I like this again. Remember, the focus was let's discredit the messenger with the hope that we can discredit the message. right? And what Paul is saying here is, hey, listen, I'm not discouraged about what's being said. My coming to you, it was not a waste of time. My coming to you was not in vain as he opens up. Despite the fact that we've been treated horribly in Philippi, we, we didn't let that, let that distract us from bringing to you the gospel. In other words, what Paul's saying is, listen, I hear what's being said. It might, not, it might have been easier not to even come, but I don't have any regrets. I came to please God, not man. He's like, listen, despite what you've heard, our appeal to you does not spring from error because that's what they were accusing him of. It doesn't come to you out of impurity or any attempt to deceive. I didn't come to please man. I came to, I came to please God. And so he's, he's setting the stage. And now he's going to begin to address some of the specific accusations that were launched against him. Look at verse 5. For we never came to you with words of flattery, as you know, they, probably, they likely accused him of that. 
We never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is a witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. For we were gentle among you, like a, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Isn't that beautiful? So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, I love this, but also our own selves. Why? Because you had become very dear to us. And so Paul is addressing the things that he is being accused of, and he's raising the awareness of what and how a godly pastor is to engage with this church. The first thing Paul says here is, he says, listen, we didn't seek to flatter you. We didn't seek to impress you. We didn't seek to flatter you. A godly pastor seeks to point you to Jesus and not himself. A godly pastor seeks to point you to Jesus and not himself. Churches become unhealthy when the personality of the leader becomes more important than the personality of Jesus. And I've never heard a pastor say he wants to do that. But sometimes the environment gets created where everybody knows the biggest personality in the room is the pastor. And the job of the pastor, the responsibility of the pastor, is to make sure that Jesus is the greatest personality in the room. Right? How many people we've seen who have been drawn to a pastor... And when that pastor falls, the sheep are scattered, right? Pointing people to Jesus. People, Paul said, we didn't seek to flatter you. A pastor needs to push against or push back against that because here's the reality. People want idols. People want heroes. People want, eleva- people, people want to elevate Leaders, it's, in, it's, in our, it's on our wiring, it's, it's so unhealthy. I see so many pastors, I deal with so many pastors that what ends up happening is people want to believe that there's someone who has it all together, they've got everything right, and they elevate the pastor and it triggers something in the heart of the pastor that is very sinful and, every, and very real and is in every pastor. It's a desire to be built up. Considered like, wow. And Paul said, that wasn't the way I came to you. We didn't come to flatter. We came to elevate Jesus, right? Second thing he says is this. He says, we didn't want to get anything from you. No, no pretext for greed. We, we, there was no agenda whatsoever. We didn't come into Thessalonica looking to see how we can build our ministry here, Right? You were our ultimate goal, right? You're thriving, you're flourishing, your connection with Jesus. There was no higher goal than you. A godly pastor doesn't use the church to fulfill his vision. The people in the church are not a means to his end. They're the goal of the shepherd. The focus of the shepherd is the sheep not bigger and greener pastures, right? It's the sheep. Paul is addressing the motive of the leader's care for the church. In short, what Paul is saying here is, I came to you with no strings attached. You see, when the pastor has strings attached, it it always hurts people, doesn't it? It leaves them feeling used, causes them to be burnt out, makes them feel like nothing more than a, than a pawn on the pastor's chessboard. Maybe you're here today and you've been on the receiving end of that, hopefully not here, where you gave and you gave and you gave and you gave and you didn't have anything else to give and you just got pushed aside. Likewise, having strings attached hurts the pastor as well. The pastor needs to guard his heart to not expect because, because people are going to disappoint. A 
pastor that gets into the ministry not thinking he's going to not get hurt is headed for a, a very short time in the ministry. I've learned the hard way that people like pastors have agendas as well. They'll say, well, I just want to serve. I just want to, I just want to use my gifts. But when they don't get their way, they leave. I just, I just want a place to, to platform my gifts. And what they really want to do is control things. And when they realize they can't control things, they just, they just move on from church to church to church to church. And in the past, and what they do is they leave behind a trail of accusations against the pastors. I've learned that when the wolf tells the story, the shepherd is always the villain. We need to be careful to have right expectations of one another. We need to live in authenticity, authenticity with one another, transparency, recognizing, listen, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We're a bunch of people who are looking to be like Jesus. And if we can just have realistic expectations, it won't shock us when somebody does something that doesn't meet our expectations, right? Now, if there's a long pattern of that, that's a different conversation for a different day. But, but don't go into this with strings attached. I will do this if you do that. It only sets the ground for disappointment. Disappointment is the result of misplaced expectations, right? Thirdly, Paul says, we didn't seek the glory from people. Paul's like, listen, I wasn't looking to kind of get like, get anybody's glory here. I wasn't seeking the glory of people. A godly pastor recognizes his role is to ensure all the glory goes to God. Listen, if something good around, hey, around here happens, I can guarantee you all the glory goes to God because it happens in the midst of very flawed people. And so if something good around here happens, it happens because, and all the glory goes to God. If something tanks around here, We'll take the credit of that for that, right? <laughs> Something got in the way of God's plan, usually our humanity. Paul did an amazing, had an amazing ministry in Macedonia, and an amazing ministry in Thessalonica. Paul had an amazing ministry all throughout his time while on the earth. And the reality of it is everywhere he went, he made sure, don't look at us, look at Christ. All of the glory went to Christ. Number fourth, Paul said this, we didn't make demands, though permissible. We could have, but we didn't. He's saying that while we didn't seek the glory from people, which obviously invites honor in an appropriate way, financial care in an appropriate way, he'll write about those as appropriate in his letters. He's saying we didn't demand it from you. Paul will make reference to the trust that he earned amongst the people, not demanded from the people. Trust is earned, isn't it? It's not demanded. A godly pastor doesn't demand respect. He earns it over time with his actions. Number five, Paul says this, we were gentle like a nursing mother for her children. A beautiful picture. We were gentle like a nursing mother for her children. What a beautiful illustration Paul gives of his care for the church. Like a nursing mother who from her own resources generously and selflessly shares of herself to ensure the health, the vitality, and the well-being of her child. Likewise, Paul says, not only were we willing to share with you the gospel, but our very lives, because you've come, become so dear to us. See, it's very interesting what's going on here. Paul is modeling for them what he is calling them to do throughout the rest of the text. Many of the things that he's saying he's not guilty of, 
are, are the very things that he is highlighting that we need to avoid on our, on our spiritual journey. We need to remember something, that Paul was a, fa- was a Pharisee before coming to Christ. You see, as a Pharisee, they were always looking to flatter, flatter people. They were always looking to impress people. They were always looking to make people go, wow, look at them. Pharisees were always known for being harsh. Pharisees were always had strings attached to their connections with people, right? They were always making unreasonable demands of people. And having been a Pharisee himself, Paul had to turn from that and show not what he was, but who he is, and to now show the heart of Christ, the heart of a servant, a shepherd. And so he will, he will highlight those things that were consistent perhaps with his life as a Pharisee, but no longer as a servant of Christ. So powerful. An incredible example of Christ in Paul. Look at verse 9. He says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into the kingdom, into his own kingdom and glory. What Paul's doing here is he's bringing to remembrance what their true experience was. He's saying, listen, despite what you've heard, just let's put all the, the chatter that you've heard aside. Let's just bring to your remembrance, remembrance what was reality when we walked together. Because sometimes when there's too much chatter, the truth oftentimes gets forgotten and history gets put aside. And so what Paul is bringing back to the remembrance, remember what it was like when we were together. He's reminding them, hey, listen, remember, we weren't a financial burden to you. I mean, if I was looking for gain, I was, I was, we were certainly no financial burden to you. Paul will clearly teach in, in his epistles that it's appropriate for a minister of the gospel to make his livelihood off of the gospel. But while he was there in Thessalonica, he chose to work because the church was young. The church was just starting. It was just you know, weeks, or months old at this point. They couldn't possibly afford to finance Paul. And so he said, we, we didn't put any financial burden on you. That's a lie. He says, we, we conducted ourselves in a holy and righteous and, and blameless way. You can say, well, Paul, that's kind of arrogant. No, I think he needs, what he needs to do sometimes to combat lies, you've got to be clear about what reality is. And he's like, we, we're holy. We we're righteous. We we're blameless. Again, Paul's calling them to bring into remembrance what they had seen in Paul versus what they had heard from Paul. He's saying, don't let anyone change the narrative on our, what our relationship is, right? Don't let somebody put in your ears something that you know is not true. He said, we walked blameless before you. In other words, they, we, we lived above reproach. We didn't engage in things that, that could become stumbling blocks or, or cause for wrong conclusions, right? Things that might have been permissible, we didn't engage even in those things so that anybody could, could hurl a false accusation. We, we, let, we lived our lives above reproach. We were blameless. It's interesting what he highlights here. Says they, they, were, they were attacking the work of God, not Paul. I mean, they wanted the work of God to stop. They really didn't care less about Paul. He was already out of the city. You know, when we consider all that the Bible has to say about gossip and slander and character assassination, we need to recognize that the enemy isn't trying to bring a person down. He's trying to bring the work of God down. The devil doesn't really care about you or me. He just doesn't want us to influence the world for Christ, right? He's trying to bring the the work of Christ down. Thankfully, he's not going to succeed. Jesus said, I'll build my church in the gates of hell. They're not going to prevail against it. 
But that's why the scripture is very clear about being careful about what we say to and about one another. Something God takes very serious. Proverbs chapter 6 in verse 16, God lays out for us the things that he, that he hates. You know, God hates things. I mean, as a believer in Christ, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be able to define the things that God loves so I can love what God loves, but I also wanted to hate the things that God hates, right? How many want to hate the things that God hates, right? Because here's the deal. God hates the things that aren't good for the glory of God and for the, the bride of Christ. And so we see in chapter 6 of Proverbs, here's, here's, here's what God says. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Now, I don't know about you, but if I read a passage like this, I think to myself, here's if God's about to let me know the things that he hates, one of which is an absolute abomination, that catches my attention. Right? Here's the things that God hates. He hates haughty eyes. What is that? As someone who looks down on other people. Thinks that they're better than other people. Pride. He hates haughty eyes. He hates a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. God hates a heart that devises wicked plans and feet that make haste to run to evil. Number six, God hates a false witness who breathes out lies. And this one that is an abomination to him is one who sows discord amongst brethren. Wow. Interestingly, three out of the four of the three out of the seven of these all have to do with the, laps, with the lips, the mouth, what we say, right? The lying tongue, the false witness, witness the, the sowing of discord amongst brethren. What does that say? We need to be very careful of the conversations we engage in, the way we speak to and about one another. The church is the bride of Christ. And I want to tell you something, Jesus loves the bride. He loves the bride. And when we speak against the bride, we speak, about the, we speak against the bride of Christ. And God hates that. All right, let's move on. Verse 7. We see in verse 7 that, that Paul was likening himself to a gentle, nursing mother who cares for her own children. And now in verse 11, he says, look, he says, verse 11, he says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I love that. In verse 7, he's like, here's how we dealt with you like a mom. Here's how now, here's how we dealt with you like a dad. Like a father, he says, like a father, we exhorted you, we encouraged you, and we charged you. We exhorted to be encouraged and charged to do what? To walk in a manner worthy of God. To walk in a manner worthy of God. I don't know about you, but I know with every one of my kids at one time or another, I, we had the conversation. You represent me, right? Remember where you go when you're outside this house, what you do is a reflection on your family. Here's how we live. Here's how we do. Here's how we prioritize. Here's how we treat people. Here's how we love people. Here's how we work. Here's what we, and we, because you're a balsamo, this is how you live your life, right? Because where you go, you're a reflection of me. And, and it's almost like we see the father heart of Paul taking his, his church and placing it on his lap. And he exhorts them, and he encourages them, and he charges them. Walk in a manner worthy, not of me, Paul, but of God. Walk in a manner worthy of God. As we get further into the chapter, we're going to see specifically some of the ways that that is to happen. What's the difference between exhorting and encouraging in charging, I'm really glad you asked that because there's something very significant here that I think is, is helpful for us. He says, like a father, they, they exhorted them. He, he sets the bar high and he says to them, listen, you can do it. 
You're a child of God. You're a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. You're no longer work walking in darkness. You're walking in the light. You've got God, the Holy Spirit in you. You don't have to sin anymore. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You can do this. You can pull it off. He's encouraging them. He's exhorting them. Exhortation paints a vision of who you can be. It's inspiring. He's saying, man, you can do it. Everything you need is within you because you've got the Spirit of God within you. And he exhorts them. But he also encourages them. Because sometimes, sometimes we hit it out of the park. Sometimes we just strike out, don't we? Sometimes we, we walk in truth and we put it in motion. Sometimes we believe a lie and we put that in motion. Sometimes we, sometimes we hit the mark. Sometimes we get hit by the mark. We drop the ball and we fail. But you see, a father doesn't allow failure to define his child. Instead, he, he picks him up. He brushes him off. He reminds him, listen, if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He encourages them along the way. He recognizes, listen, you're not going to hit it out of the park every time. You're not a failure, right? I write these things, John will say, that you might not sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so he's saying, listen, here's what you can be. And on those days where you're not, let me encourage you. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. He exhorted them. He encouraged them. And then he charged them. That wasn't rent. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> he charged them. You should charge them rent. He exhorted them. He encouraged them. He charged them. A charge is when you a good father, he, he doesn't lower the bar. He doesn't change the standard based on the strengths or weaknesses of the child. He calls us up higher. He makes clear the expectation. You might not have gotten victory in every area of your life, but let me be clear here. God is not going to move the goalpost just so you can feel like you're in the end zone. God's Ways and his laws and his rules and expectations and his standards and truth, it does not change. And so what he's saying here is he's charging them. He's saying, listen, God does not change. As you're working this thing out, as you're working out your own salvation through fear and trembling, right? That's sanctification, by the way. That's God, the Holy Spirit, enabling us to be what God wants us to be. He's saying, listen, as you're pursuing it, don't think God's not going to move the goalpost for you. Truth doesn't change by culture. Hello? Standards don't change. God's word does not change. And so as we're journeying through, we encourage, we charge, we exhort. And that's what Paul is doing with the church in Thessalonica. In fact, in the following passages, we see Paul is, is doing that very thing. Of, he's exhorting, encouraging, and charging them. Look at verse 13. He said, as we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, when you heard it from us, you accepted it not as word from men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, you became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. What's interesting is Paul is saying here, he's saying, listen, remember, we need to remember that these, these are new Christians and they are being persecuted because they are embracing Christ and they are, they are suffering because they are turning away from what is acceptable in their community, right? And as a result of that, they are suffering just like the churches in Judea. 
He's saying, listen, guys, you're not the only one. Sometimes it's going to get difficult. Sometimes it's going to be inconvenient. Sometimes people are going to hate you. And then he points out what their own countrymen and what the Jews were doing to the churches in Judea. What were they doing? This is the, what was happening to the churches in Judea? He says, listen, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They killed the prophets. Paul's like, they drove us out. They displease God. They oppose all kinds. They oppose all mankind by, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always, they do this to fill up the measure of their sins. In other words, all of their getting in the way is for selfish gain for them. And they're treating you just like they have treated all the church. He says this, oh, look, he says, but, but wrath has come upon them at last. Now, we, we, could, we, we could read that and think like, wow, that kind of sounds harsh, right? Like, it's almost like Paul's saying, get ready, it's coming down. It's going to rain fire down on the people. It's kind of like Jonah waiting for, for Nineveh to get wiped out, right? He's got his popcorn, he's just kind of waiting for God's wrath to be poured out. It just doesn't happen, right? And it could sound like that's what Paul's saying, but that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, but the wrath has come to, upon them at last. Literally, in the Greek, what that means is the, the, the word at last is actually interpreted forever. In other words, but wrath is to come upon them forever. The judgment of God is going to abide upon them forever. Paul affirms their authentic faith. He says, you, you embraced the word of God from us as if it was from God himself. I love that. They heard the word as if it was from God himself. He said, secondly, you not only heard the word, you applied the word of God to your life. Right? You aren't just hearers of the word, you were, you were doers of the word. He says the word was at work in you as believers. You embrace the word and you applied the word. And then thirdly, he says, you embrace the consequences of being faithful to Jesus, just like the churches in Judea. In other words, listen, you loved Christ even more than your own life. Paul wraps up this section again with the proud heart of a father. Look at verse 17, he says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. I love the heart of a dad in this, right? Paul's like, listen, they may have thrown me out of your city, but my heart is with you. We endeavor to be more eagerly with you. To, my desire is to be with you so we can see each other face to face. Like a dad looking to gather the family around the table, right? So I long to see you face to face. He says, but look, he says, but, but Satan hindered us. Interesting. Notice he doesn't blame the authorities who ruled in Thessalonica, but he blames the prince of the power of the air that ruled over Thessalonica, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark age. And so the reality of it is, it wasn't the authorities that kept us from coming to you, but it was Satan himself, the prince of the power of the air. But then he says this, here's his proud dad moment. You ready for it? I love this. Look, he says, look, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming. What is the thing we're looking for? I'm looking forward to. What is my hope and my joy? What is my crown? Is it not you? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Now, Paul's having a very appropriate heart of a pastor shepherd towards his people. What is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? 
for you are our glory and joy. What a beautiful picture of a man who not only loves the Lord Jesus, but loves the bride of Jesus as well, the bride of Christ. May his model and his priority be lived out in all of us. In chapter 2, we see Paul's relationship with the church, and it's beautiful. And we're going to see how that beautiful relationship in chapter 3, we're going to see how that impacted the church's relationship with God and its influence in all the world. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for how it highlights truth, it challenges us, it informs us, it encourages us, indeed, it exhorts us, it encourages us, it charges us to walk in a manner worthy of God. And Lord, as your people, we pray that God, we would do just that, that we would hear your word and that we would apply it in our hearts and in our lives that we would indeed be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, would you help us to love the bride of Christ, not only as much as you love the bride of Christ, but even as much as Paul loved the bride of Christ. We thank you for one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.